All right, welcome everyone to a Green Terror Talk featuring student faculty COVID-19 research on the Hill. My name is Sam Hopkins. I'm a member of the class of 1980. And currently I'm a principal scientist at Asclepios Biopharmaceutical. And I lead the research development and clinical evaluation of novel adeno-associated viral vectors. And for those of you not familiar with that term, it translates to gene therapy for the treatment of rare neuromuscular diseases. I also have the distinct pleasure of serving as a member of the McDaniel College Board of Trustees. And I'm also joined by my co-host, Kevin Webster. Well, hello everyone. My name is Kevin Webster. I graduated from McDaniel in 2019 with a major in biology and a minor in chemistry. I now attend the University of the District of Columbia for a master's program in cancer biology, prevention and control. I'm a, I'm a brother of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated and I enjoy playing video games and watching anime in my free time. During the summer, McDaniel students work with fac faculty members to conduct research on the COVID-19 virus, and they are excited to share with you how the research came about. In addition to relaying the benefits, McDaniel offers our future scientists. We'll also learn about our new STEM center. All right, thank you, Kevin. So tonight I've got the pleasure of introducing our faculty and staff for the talk. We're joined by Drs. Peter Craig and Dana Ferraris. Peter teaches in the chemistry department and has been at McDaniel since 2006, teaching general food, bioanalytical, and bioorganic, bioinorganic chemistry, excuse me, a course that didn't exist in my day. And together with uh, his students, they make metal containing complexes to tackle bacteria, cancer, pollution, and viruses. Dana Ferraris is the chair of the Department of Chemistry He's the inventor of an FDA approved drug, research mentor to over 30 McDaniel students, chemical savant, coffee aficionado, co-owner of the Kismet Cafe, and what I'm most envious of, a member of the Bocce Ball Hall of Fame, a mediocre golfer, and a below average academic advisor. <laughs> Dane is at the start of his sixth year here at McDaniel. I'd also like to introduce Ben Smith, and Ben joined McDaniel the college community this semester as the inaugural director of the new STEM Center. He brings over a decade of experience working with students and faculty in developing college level academic support programming for the sciences. We're excited to welcome him to campus. Now, this is, this gotta be the most exciting part right here. So I'm <laughs> thrilled to introduce our hardworking students to the talk. Zachary Kick is a chemistry major with a concentration in biochemistry he is the president of Gamma Sigma Epsilon, captain of the men's swim team, coffee enthusiast, and one half of the Bocce Ball Hall of Fame team. Now, Prilla, Priscilla Owusu also joins us, a chemistry major with a minor in French. Priscilla self-proclaims that she is a decent track and field athlete, an average linguist, an avid TV watcher, TV watcher and she is the second half of the real Bocce Ball Hall of Fame. I got to figure out this bocce ball hall of fame. I need to learn how to play myself. And rounding out our slate of students is Michaela Patterson, a biology and biomedical sciences double major with a minor in chemistry. She plays on the volleyball team here at McDaniel and is in the honors program, as well as various honor societies. Michaela is the president of the pre-health club this year, and she plans to apply to medical school when she graduates. And if I must add, she pretty much helped me get through physics when I was still in McDaniel. Now they are all seniors and I just want to wish them, wish them well as they finish up their studies this year at McDaniel. Thanks, Kevin. So to get down to tonight's topic, with the possible exception of the upcoming presidential election, I think all of us would agree that no topic touches us more than the global COVID pandemic. And within that context, there are probably limitless topics. So I think it's best to start off by, dis by defining the scope for tonight's discussion. We won't be talking about basic virology or clinical features of the disease, and we won't be talking about the pandemic in socio-political terms. We will focus on what the college can do in response to the pandemic. Comprehensive responses to infectious disease outbreaks typically involve three main elements, prevention in the form of public health and education, vaccine development, and therapeutic development. Now, in terms of what we can do at the campus, I'd like principally to talk to the faculty tonight and address the question that knowing that we live in an age of information sharing, how can access to emerging data on the virus itself enable a drug discovery program in a small college context? 
So Dana, Peter, I'd turn things over to you right now. Want me to go first, Peter, or do you want to go? Oh, first? you go. All right. Um, so yeah, this is an interesting time we live in. So we, um, unlike many, you know, drug discovery projects, COVID nineteen has is, is worldwide. Uh, you know, has affected the world. You know, so uh, the, the scientists in general, I think, what you'll find is that they're they're more than willing to share data. You know, any paper you see out there with COVID on it is is freely accessible. Um, some undertakings, basically group sourcing type undertakings have happened in the field of medicinal chemistry, of which I'm part of. And I, you know, I kind of was shocked at the amount of data that's actually out there saying, hey, you know what, there's a lot of really smart people. Take some of this data and run with it. You know, there's a million different directions you can go on and, and do it. Um, with anybody and any resources that you can. And so we kind of uh, started at that point and, and really ran with it. Um, and Peter, I'm sure you can, can add some some uh, directions that, that you guys have, have taken as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd, um, I'm gonna give you a more siloed angle. Um, the approach that we took was much more opportunistic in the sense that we had some compounds that inspired by some work at Northwestern University, we, we saw some opportunities because it just so happened that some of these COVID-19 proteins that present themselves happen to have some handles on them that allow access for some of the compounds we're making that might cause them to shut down those proteins. So it was sort of a very um, uh, opportunistic approach to try something that wasn't designed specifically for COVID but on a kinetic basis way might show some activity if we happen to bring the two, two parties to meet, the compounds we make and the opportunity which, which presented itself to have a company in San Diego that would allow us to uh, interact with some of the proteins that are presented by COVID-19. So just from my, own, from my own questioning, I think when people outside the community here were doing COVID research on the Hill, I think one thing that may strike them is, is this, is this actually using live virus? Is this in any way hazardous? What is the basis for the research? And I think if you could describe that more, what, what are the features that in that universe of information that's available? Is it protein coordinates? Is it docking programs? What can you do to interface your medicinal chemistry expertise with potential targets in the virus that themselves could become therapeutics? Yeah, so th like I mentioned before, a lot of the, the data that uh, under normal circumstances might be trapped in a, a pharmaceutical vault for years and years is now freely available. So, you know, in, in rather in layman's terms, if you have, you know, a, a shape that kind of looks like this little Pac-Man right here and you can fit something inside of it to completely stop its action and stop the virus, you know, replication cycle, that's pretty important, you know, and a lot of the, the pharmaceutical, um, you know, like I said, that their uh, uh, projects and their ideas and all the science behind it, a lot of times is held really close to the vest. Well, nowadays, there are, there are companies out there that are actually showing this data freely to anybody. Um, you can actually design compounds send them, you know, synthesize them, send them to, to this, to, uh, to the same company, they'll test them and they'll publish the data right online. So again, it's a more group sourcing effort. It's very unique. I don't remember, you know, my 15, 20 years in the industry ever seeing something like this happen. So um, what can we do to help? We can make the compounds and that's really what we're trying to do. Do we have live, live viruses on campus? Only the, the two or three kids that are infected are, are the only live viruses that we have on campus and they're in a quarantine facility. So no, we don't. And we're not, you know, working with live viruses. We're really just making small molecules. I, I think the thing that was interesting to me was how, um, how uh, safe the, the students were in terms of their ability to, uh, you know, obviously not contract a virus or bring it to the party. I think that was, that was quite an impressive thing over eight weeks of research. That was something that I, I thought was quite neat. I'm gonna pick up on the Pac-Man analogy. Um, if you think of Pac-Man and the ability for it to eat, it has this sort of uh, triangular shape to its mouth and it moves it across the screen in those traditional games from years ago. I'd angle, I'd angle that our research is trying to look at the fact that yes, uh, there's a mouth in Pac-Man, but we're going after the nose. 
The nose might not be involved directly with the eating, but it might be involved with smelling the food. And if you impair the nose, you might not know what you're smelling or you're eating. So that was the angle we were trying on. Uh, and as I said, quite opportunistically, and as Dana said, it's all about um, using what skills the students have and expanding them somewhat, but also realizing there are limitations to that and then using external parties to test them and have a flow back loop to inspire the students to make more things that might take us in a different direction. So I think that was one of the attractive parts of the summer. And it's quite unique in the sense, as Dana said, to have that flow through loop of feedback to allow us to actually um, to get get a cyclical approach to, to it, which really wouldn't happen in the time frame of a college summer uh, in my past experience. So that was kind of a quite a neat aspect. And I talked to the students directly and they said they were pretty motivated by simply by the fact that you had a company contact them in a week. We had a week turnover, I think, was our first round of testing. And they came back to us within a week with data, which was kind of ridiculous. That's the same as what Elementals come back from Georgia. They, they come back in about a week. But these were data points from initial test concentrations. And wow, um, it was really interesting to, to think that, oh, your work was going somewhere and your work was you going missed. nowhere. It was quite interesting to see that all suddenly happen. So yeah, it was quite, um, and then you had to turn, turn the cycle over in terms of giving them different directions. So yeah, it was quite a neat experience. So take us through a, a, a typical exercise. Is this a computer assisted design type of exercise? What's the, the, what's the molecular blueprint you start with first? Yeah. Do you have other relations other than biologists and chemists who you bring in the project? I mean, certainly you know, in, our, in our world, we'll use mathematicians, we use physicists, yeah. we use biophysicists. I've asked janitors before for their impression of what I'm doing. So I freely associate with all people who could give me a jump start as to what, what I'm doing. But take us through the iteration. How is this accomplished and what, what parts do you engage in? Yeah, so the parts that we engage in, uh, uh, like I said, a lot of this data is online. So you know, the first thing you do is you look at, and it's uh, crystallography data for my group. Um, we can see exactly um, how a certain small molecule fits in the active site. And, I, uh, you know, this, that kind of data is incredibly powerful. And when a even a student, even somebody that's untrained in the area looks at it and says, wow, that really kind of fits like a glove. Okay. And they take that and they say, well, you know what, we can make it work better. We can actually put this other little piece off the end of it to make it fit better. Or you know what, there's one that fits in this pocket and there's one that fits in a pocket right next to it. We can kind of just kind of bridge the gap and link the two. And, and that was one strategy that we used as well that seemed to work. Mm -hmm. So um, crystallography data um, enlisted from, like I said, the group sourcing effort, the, the company that tested most of them is a contract research group that, like I said, they basically did it for, for the cost of reagents, you know, and they turned around the, the data um, in, as Peter said, a week or two. It's amazing turnover and you wouldn't typically get it under um, normal circumstances unless you're, you know, paying through the nose. Um, so, um, you know, a lot of pieces had to fall into place in order for this to happen, but that's kind of how we, we approached uh, the problem. It's kind of ironic. I, I teach crystallography, but I did not go that route. I, um, I looked at some papers that were um, for these types of compounds that had been established before, and one was in, still in clinical trial. And we sort of thought, well, this has been used to attack other types of uh, handles uh, in biology in terms of um, inhibiting them previously. Maybe we could try this on COVID and see if it would have any impact. So we didn't really look at it from a structural point of view at all. It was more on a kinetic basis. So we knew there were some papers out there that had a motif of structure and we looked at it and we thought well we can make things of the same sort of structure but if we just tweak it a little bit maybe we could make it more or less active for the COVID situation and so we had a few things we could change and we just essentially made different versions of the same sort of molecules and um, changed them in a, in a tweaking like fashion and sent off these derivatives to San Diego and we saw whether it had a good or bad um, impression on the, on the protein it was supposed to be inhibiting. So, so that was the basis of it. Um, but, but you're right, it's not like we had a whole team of differently skilled uh, specialists in the college, but it didn't matter. It was more a case of what are we going to contribute here? And that would be some leads to which our, other sources might use if we were to publish this data 
because mm -hmm. they have better resources or better, uh, they have more resources to bear on the situation should they find any of the work that we do interesting. Mm -hmm. yep. So do you start the students off with a, a literature type research? Because there's gotta be a wealth of information on the SARS 2003 virus. Yeah. And that was certainly explored for the past two decades. So much of what constitutes a, a human pathogen from a coronavirus perspective has been known. And when, when, we, when Peter talks about a handle, um, often in, in more scientific terms, we talk about a vetted, a proven biological target that if you modify its function, it will then alter or completely inhibit the replication of the virus. Do the students play a role in looking at these particular targets and selection and saying, Dr. Forrest, Dr. Craig, I think if we look at a protease or a nucleotide reductase, that these are possible targets. Where, where does the actual, what's the genesis of the project? How early did the students get involved? Well, interestingly enough, you know, as soon as, uh, so COVID shut down the college in, in March, mid-March, you know, after spring break. Um, I, I, at the time I was teaching organic chemistry too, and medicinal chemistry, medicinal chemistry, my favorite class, I decided to, to do, you know, and again, this is something McDaniel college will allow you to do. You know what? Fly by the seat of your pants, teach them what you think they need to be taught whenever you think they need to be taught. And, and I, I completely tweaked the end of my medicinal chemistry class to include, and like you mentioned, SARS had been out there for almost 20 years. Um, so actually quite a bit is known about um, its life, uh, you know, or it's a uh, replication cycle mm -hmm. and all the basic, you know, what are the main targets on its replication cycle and that kind of thing. So talking about the medicinal chemistry behind it was actually pretty easy because there is a ton of things out there. And like I said, they're all available. Well, I invited my orgo class to the med chem class because it's all online anyways, and it was pretty easy to do. And actually a lot of them, ended up, um, you know, watching in on it. So for the last half of the semester, all of the students that ended up working in my summer lab were kind of getting this, you know, getting a preview of what they were going to kind of work on uh, over the summer. So uh, it was beneficial from that, that point of view and, and kind of fortuitous. But um, yeah, you're right. There was, there was actually quite a bit out there and a, a lot of really sexy drug discovery targets uh, along that pathway. Well, fantastic. I think it's probably a great time to transition yeah. uh, to hear really from our students. So, Kevin, um, I think it'd be great if you could engage each of the teams and have them highlight their research and what they've done and, and what it's meant to them. All right, sounds good. Yeah, um, so we can start off with Dr. Uh, Dr. Craig and Michaela. I want to hear about the just your summer, just the, how was this research over the summer? I know it's a little different since, uh, well, when I was a research student, I was actually in the lab and everything. And I, I want to hear Sometimes. how you guys overcame yeah. that and everything that had everything that happened. Okay, uh, Michaela, do you want to start or you want to? Yeah, I can start either way. Okay, well, you okay. can start and I'll, I've talked too much already. So you can, you can. Okay. Um, so I actually did more of kind of a virtual um, research opportunity over the summer. So I was actually working full time in the admissions office, um, but I had planned with Dr. Craig to do kind of a manuscript. So what I did, I did research with Dr. Craig two summers ago um, and then was lucky enough to be able to come back and do research again last summer. Um, so I did more of writing up a manuscript of the research that had already been done, um, which was really amazing and really great experience too. Still working closely with Dr. Craig, um, getting to hear about all the amazing stuff that they were doing in lab as well. Um, we sent a couple samples off um, of previous research and previous compounds that we had made um, to a company actually in Australia. Um, and kind of like Dr. Farris and Dr. Craig had said, just with the wealth of information sharing and everything that's happening right now, um, they were able to get that information back to us within a few weeks. Um, it wasn't necessarily COVID related that I had been working on two summers ago, but um, still with the times of COVID and just, again, that wealth of information sharing, um, we were able to do that for free, which was awesome. Um, so that was definitely beneficial. And we found out that a couple of our compounds were active against the strain of yeast. Um, so again, not like completely COVID related, but still um, definitely beneficial in COVID times and that sh information sharing definitely helped with that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I did over the summer. That's excellent. So do I, do I see a paper in your future? I see something coming up? Yes. Yeah, we just got some of the information back um, a couple weeks ago, actually. So we're going to put that data into the paper and then hopefully get it published. 
So you go. Excellent. Dr. Craig, you have anything? Yeah, um, I can speak more to the um, the people uh, in the lab because um, we've heard of, of the, the off online uh, work. Um, we had five people working in the lab. It was very, it's equally intense. Um, it's very safe. Um, I think I think the thing that was most surprising is, is just as you probably remember yourself, not everyone with equal effort gets equal luck. And we had a few people who had charmed existences, and we had some people who got you know you know not as much luck as the amount of work they were doing would suggest. That seems to be the nature of life, and they got a dose of that pretty quickly. Um, we ended up with three families of compounds that we found that were active. Um, and we, we use our measurement yardstick against this uh, particular um, cysteine protease, which was the COVID related uh, molecule that we were testing against in uh, San Diego. We weren't doing the testing, they were, we just um, sent the samples to San Diego. So we had three families. Uh, one of the families has um, uh, essentially, if you think of having a, a metal, it has an, a water molecule attached. And that was one of the families. And we found in those, that family, in terms of its activity to inhibit this protein, we were getting data on the order of about 30% inhibition. Now we only had one data point, which was one concentration. It was, a, it was a screening situation. So we just found out that at best, we were looking at about a 30% inhibition. The second family, um, which was related to the first in the sense that these were uh, molecules that were trying to essentially attack uh, a handle by taking off that which was holding zinc and zinc was our target. So there were various parts of the molecule that the protein that was holding onto zinc and we were fighting for, for those arms that hold zinc. The second of the two families that did that, um, we had some greater success in that family. We were getting on the order of 60 to 80% inhibition of the protein, which quite surprised me. Uh, it still surprises me. Um, and pleases me and uh, the students are quite uh, tickle pink about that one. Uh, pretty happy about that. Um, the third family was looking at a different perspective and that was not looking at a different handle at all, but looking at how we address the handle rather than taking the fingers that off that hold the zinc atom or zinc iron that, that's in the protein, we would directly go for the zinc itself. So these were things that were designed to sequester or grab hold of the zinc iron and rip it out of the protein and thus the protein's activity would shut down. So we had two, two main, at least uh, postulates of ways that we think we're, we were attacking the protein. One was to remove the groups that were holding the zinc ions in the protein and thus inhibiting the protein's function. The second uh, type of uh, mode of action, if you like, was direct, directly attack the zinc ion and rip it out from the protein directly. And that family that was ripping out the, the zinc completely was getting on the order of about 23 to 25% inhibition of the protein. So, um, you know, we had a range, we had everything from no inhibition to uh, at best 80% 80, 80 inhibition. So um, it was quite encouraging. Obviously it's very early days. We'd have to obviously test and retest and get IC50 data, which is data over a greater range of concentration that we'd be looking at uh, to see what that would be for the 50% of the population. but um, it was encouraging um, and it was, for me at least, it was kind of quite cool that we could get feedback to certainly direct where we went to next much faster, which, which was kind of a neat aspect. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. That sounds, it sounds like you guys are doing excellent work. Um, honestly, I, I wish I could go back and do it again, if I must say. <laughs> um, but Dr. Ferraris, Priscilla and Zach, can you guys give us a highlight of how the summer went for you guys. So you guys were actually in lab, Priscilla and Zach, right? If I'm, if I'm correct, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I want to hear about your experiences throughout that time. Honestly, with COVID this summer, research didn't look that much different than it usually does besides having to wear a mask every day and not being able to sit in Dr. Ferrars' office and drink coffee for an hour or two and just blow off some time. But other than that, it, <laughs> other than that, it didn't really look that much different. Um, you know, it's just, I was competitive as always trying to, so you can make the most compounds. And I will admit, Priscilla kicked my butt this summer. She got like four or five more compounds than I did, but you know. I'll take L's, bro. I'm not gonna lie to you. <laughs> but I will admit defeat in that part. But other than that, it didn't really look that different. We were still able to all go into lab every day safely, still hang out, have fun, play jokes on each other, have fun. So that's my side of it. I don't know if Priscilla had the same experiences. I'm hoping so. I hope I was a good partner. 
It was a it was a really fun experience, and I just wanted to um, talk about something Dr. Craig mentioned um, when we got back our first um, results from San Diego, and that was really like a, a kick in the butt because most of my <laughs> <laughs> reactions did failure not... is the norm, Priscilla. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't do as well, and so I was really really nervous. But then we found out that it was tested against the wrong protease. So we had to like we had two um, proteases to work work against, and it was really cool. So yeah, I was really excited. Yeah, tell them about the second round of testing though. We just got the data. Yeah, so I started working with nephroquinones, and like the um they're really good. The results are really good, and hopefully I can uh, keep working during the um, winter break. So yeah, can... that'd be great. That'd be I great. got my butt kicked again during the second term as well. <laughs> Didn't get that good of results. It's all right. It's all right. It's okay, we bounce back. It's okay. No, it definitely, the open sourcing though, I think, because I had previously done part research with Dr. Forrest over Jan term of 2019 to 2020. Yeah. Definitely this summer was, I would say, more fun because due to all the open sourcing, because as we were making compounds, more papers were coming in and we were seeing, oh, we have this similarity. So about when we got the, when we were sending off for the second results, Dr. Forrest kind of looked at me and said, you know what, we have this giant library of compounds. Let's start throwing stuff together and basically throwing it to the wall and see what sticks and we'll get some stuff back. Maybe it works. And that was just super cool to get papers and being like, Oh, I'm kind of going down this route as well, but different starting materials. Let's see what happens and check their similarities out. Yeah. And even though we're all uh, different groups, were working on different methods of um, the fragments. It was still like easier to go be like, Oh, Hey, like, we can look at one person's structure and figure out a better way to modify it and make it better. So it was just a lot of like communication between like the different groups in our research team. Pretty cool. Okay, excellent. And Dr. Farge, you have anything? I could talk all day about how badass these kids are. I mean, you know that, right? Like these kids, okay, Kevin, I mean, how many, how many compounds did you guys make over the summer? Do you remember? Uh, I, know, <laughs> I know Q made more than me. <laughs> I think I, Zach, I'm in the same position. I, my partner made a lot more than me. Yeah, but, but, but I mean, as a group, you guys were incredibly productive. Yeah. I think you guys probably made close to 50 compounds over the summer. Mm -hmm. You know how many compounds these kids make? They made a hundred. Not, not as good as us. So I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> they made 106 compounds this summer, believe it or not. Right, you guys gotta, you gotta, gotta leave now. <laughs> Oh, thanks for having us. When, when you need it the most, when you really need it the most, they came through. I mean, they were incredibly productive. But, you know, the, I, I think the reason why is they couldn't do as many, like, fun things. You know, okay. like, we, we went to, 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 you know, we did the bocce ball thing. We, we had a cookout. You can do that outside. You can, you know, go to Hoffman's Ice Cream because they got an e eating area outside and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But... I mean, I think we had a lot more. We had the crab feast. We had, um, what else did we do? We, we had cookouts probably once a week, that kind of thing. And that was the summer research experience. They didn't quite get that, but mm -hmm. they took advantage of it because they were in lab the whole time. And that's what they, you know, that's where they spent their time. So um, they were a great group. Really, really great. I'm su super proud of them. And, and, and a couple of them want to come back for Jan term. So I get them twice oh, which is great i don't have to train them again you know <laughs> now now before we move on to anything else i want to i want to ask about this bocce ball okay um, yeah, yeah yeah bring it up uh, i just want to i just want to know so what's the what's the teams what were the teams and who was the winner who's the loser how did that go uh zach i think you're gonna have to start with that uh so apparently dr farrar said well for his liberal arts lessons in organic chemistry he taught us how to play bocce ball and then at the beginning of the summer, he said, if we can get it socially distanced and safe, we'll go outside and we'll play. So towards the back half of the summer, we started going out and Priscilla and I were partners. We were partners in labs. We were like, hey, let's team up in bocce ball. Dr. Farris looks at us one day and says, no kids have ever beaten me. So Priscilla and I took that as a personal challenge. And we played four times. And you know what? We may have only had won one of those times, but we were the only <laughs> students to ever win. And we never played him again. So we are still the reigning champions. Yep. And that we will hold on to that. Right. So that's why they're like only half bocce ball Hall of Famers. But um, I mean, I, the summer before that, I, I didn't tell you guys that. Maybe I told you guys this, but I had Hannah Ravenscroft on my team. So she plays basketball. Oh, man, you got to get if, you, if, you, if there's a skill set that directly translates from from one sport to another, it's basketball to, to bocce. And she was just as good as I was. And we just 
Yeah, we kicked everybody's ass, so it wasn't even close. Now, now, yeah. Michaela is she has some history in basketball. Now, I'm guessing if you guys play, she may have the upper hand on this game. Uh, yeah, got she, you know, yeah. I, might, I definitely would like to try. <laughs> Set is still in my office right now, so it's perfectly <laughs> available <laughs> tomorrow. Yes. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. But it sounds like you got you all had a great experience this summer, um, this past summer. And I, I'm just happy that you guys had the experience that I even had when I was back in uh, back in McDaniel. So uh, thank you for all of that. And Sam, go ahead, take it from here. I'd be glad to. Um, and bocce ball included, I would say to all of you, don't underestimate what a college education from McDaniel uh, can do for you and where it can take you. And just from my own experience, after I finished graduate school, I was fortunate enough uh, starting in 1984 to do my uh, postdoctoral work at the Wellcome Research Laboratories in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. And that's, that's where I've been ever since. I've been here now for nearly 40 years. But at the beginning of my career, remarkably, I was assigned to work for two individuals, Trudy Ellian and George Hitchings. And for those of you <clears throat> who aren't familiar with their names, Trudy and George shared the 1988 Nobel Prize in Medicine and or Physiology. And amazingly, uh, when I would go to Trudy's office to talk to her, she made no secret of the fact that the large file she continually worked on was her Nobel acceptance speech. <laughs> Four years after I started working for her, she indeed won the prize. So for all of us now in the, in the McDaniel community, we're all now two degrees of separation from the ultimate prize in research. So again, none of you, please don't underestimate where your education can take you. So I think for the next topic, we'll explore uh, and take us to the end of the session. Uh, I th I'd like to get an idea of how we feel about how participating in a campus-based research program, what that means in terms of engaging students to the extent that they choose majors in the sciences, and then how does participating in an active research program really enhance the experience on the Hill? And finally, how can we encourage students to choose careers in research and medicine after they leave the Hill? So really this, Zach, Michaela, Priscilla, Kevin, this is really something that's, that's geared towards you. So, you know, let us know your thoughts on that topic, please. I can talk a little bit about it. Um, I was gonna say, I think that McDaniel is such a small, just campus community. I think that's something that we always talk about, but um, it really is true. And I think the relationship between faculty and students is so important. Um, I was able to do research after my sophomore year here at McDaniel. And I just think that's something that is so special. I had only taken an intro chemistry class and Dr. Craig was doing inorganic and analytical chemistry. That wasn't even English to me at the time. Um, and he sat next to me all summer and talked me through it and explained everything to me. Um, and I think that's what really encourages students to participate in summer research is just having that support from the faculty and just the McDaniel campus um, community in general. Did you know you wanted to be a science major from the time you came to McDaniel or did that experience with Dr. Craig really take you in a different direction and convince you this is what I want to do? Yeah, I was actually decided that I wanted to be pre-med um, in high school. I kind of transitioned from like athletic trainer to physical therapist to um, pre-med. And so I came in knowing that I wanted to go to medical school. Um, and so Dr. Craig, I took intro chemistry with Dr. Craig and he knew that I was interested in medical school. Um, so I think that kind of is what prompted him to ask me to do research with him. Um, but it definitely just solidified it. And um, I had never taken a huge interest in research um, because I'm very much the, I want to get the right answer, you know, but working with Dr. Craig, he walked me through it and showed me that no matter what result you get, it's a good result. Um, and that was definitely something that I learned because even if it's not the result you were expecting, you still know which way to take that research next um, to make an impact. So. And I'm like Michaela, I was the exact opposite. I came into McDaniel just wanting to get in and get out with a business major. And then I ended up having Dr. Craig for 1230 on Monday, Wednesday and Friday's freshman year for intro chem. And then we bonded over swimming. So I got to know him a lot more through that. I ended up coaching some of his kids in swimming and then uh, went on to that somewhat adequate advisor that I now have, Dr. Ferraris. And then he started <laughs> below average. <laughs> Sorry, below average. Below average. 
and then he started leaning me into, hey, you should look into some jobs that we can do and then take more chem take more science classes and then ended up dropping down to just a business minor and pursuing chemistry full time, doing research with Dr. Ferrars and being in lab again with Dr. Craig this this session, this semester and wanting to pursue it for the rest of my life really. And just having that, um, I guess, one-on-one -on -one interactions with all these professors and knowing there's not 500 kids in line trying to get to a sign-up list to want to do research. It was simple as walking in the Dr. Ferrars' office and being like, hey, I'm interested in doing research. What can we do to make this happen? And we sat down, we talked about it and I was got the research, which is super awesome. I mean, I have to congratulate Dr. Craig then because it's, it's, I would consider it near alchemy to take a business major and transform that individual into a chemistry major. So Yeah, I don't know how that happened. I heard it's always the other way around, and I don't know. Yeah, That's the typical path, yes, I think so. If it helps, I, I was an accounting major. <laughs> would you be surprised? Accounting major and chemistry wasn't in this culture, wouldn't even be a, ma a minor. And I just changed my mind when I saw the... The picket fence, the dog and the suit. I, I just couldn't stomach it. So I went back and did more another year of chemistry and went to graduate school. But I was one class away from what we call here the CPA. Uh, but it wasn't for me. But no, I'm familiar with business majors. I'm I'm, I'm <laughs> I've I've worked with that category before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think I'm in the middle because I even though I knew I wanted to do uh pre med, I was towards biology as a major instead of chem. And so um, that was, it actually made me late with my chem classes because I took chem, um, chemistry into the chem um, my sophomore year. So I was like a year late, but I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed my classes with um, uh, Dr. Polin and Dr. Ferraris. And the fact that I could just go into Dr. Ferraris' office and just sit there and have a conversation with him, it was really cool. So. Yeah. You got to wear a mask now, but yeah, you can still do that. <laughs> All right. So, so with me, um, well, uh, when I got into McDaniel, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was undecided. Um, so I, I started taking biology classes and I, I kind of knew that I wanted to do something in um, something towards the medical field. Um, but what really stands out, not just research, but with McDaniel was experiences and which McDaniel gives you the option to, gives you the, I'm going to say the, uh, the opportunity to study abroad, to, they'll help you find internships. And I think that really helped me figure out this is what I wanted to do. Um, research kind of just stacks on top of that. And what I really love about research the most is that it's one thing being in class, listening to a teacher talk to you about this, this is how this works. This is how you do this, how do you do that? Research combines everything together. So you're really doing it. Um, it made it very easy for me to, I don't know, Dr. Vargas, well, let's say uh, chromatography. Uh, I would be able, I can read it on a board and it'd be like, okay, this is, this is French. This is Spanish to me. But then it, once I do it in lab and then I can, I can, after that, I see, and I'm like, I know what to do because I've done it personally. I've done it myself. So that's one thing I love about research is just the opportunity to being able to do it yourself and learn at your own pace and just to get your hands wet. So I really like, I really like that aspect of it. And Kevin, you can speak uniquely to this, but you know, in terms of preparation and classmates and the environment you're in now from having been at McDaniel to where you are now, how well prepared do you feel you are to continue your, your degree and then compete in the research world at large? Yeah, so, so um, just even the labs that you do in class, the teachers, the professors in general at McDaniel and the sciences program do so well in preparing you for the next step. So research kind of added that, that second aspect to it, but the professors in general just, I can go, I was seeing stuff on the board that I do now. Um, PCR, um, goodness, I don't know. Uh, it's so much lysase. I, it's so much stuff I can go into, but it, it's like I can see it and I know I've done it before. And it may take a little couple, you know, a couple times to say, okay, this is I remember it fully. But McDaniel really prepares you for the next step, and I really enjoy that. And I really love that about McDaniel. All right, fantastic. Well, I think that's that clearly tells us all that students are still 
at the heart of all that McDaniel does. And the college obviously works hard to give the faculty opportunities to pull students into research. And that shows its student-centered philosophy all the more. So speaking of students, I want to ask Ben Smith, our director of the STEM Center, to talk us through the brand new STEM Center and how that supports students. So Ben. Thanks, Sam. Um, so as was mentioned in the introductions, uh, I'm relatively new to campus, this being my first semester in the middle of COVID. So uh, the STEM Center is a fairly new project here on campus, but it's one that I'm super excited about and really happy to be here on the Hill um, working with faculty and students. So one of the things that I noticed in listening to um, Michaela, Zach, Priscilla, and Kevin talk about um, is that research made the chemistry, made the science feel more real, right? And they all talked about how they were able to go into uh, and talk to Dr. Craig and talk to, talk to Dr. Ferraris um, as people, right? So you had this sort of access, um, access to the science, access to the practitioners, access to research scientists. But Something else that I noticed in all of your stories is the opportunities for research came after you took a class, right? So whether that was introductory, introductory chemistry or organic chemistry, right? You still had to take that first science course, maybe the second science course, um, before you, you could really dive in and start to identify um, that research with your own experiences. So that's part of where the STEM Center comes in, or the idea behind the STEM Center, is increasing that access. McDaniel's awesome in how small it is and how personal the, the interactions are, but we want to make sure that we're maximizing the number of on-ramps that students have. So whether you're coming in like Zach and expecting to major in something else, or you're coming in like Michaela and, and you already know that you want to go into science or like Priscilla, um, we wanna make sure that those students have the opportunity to actually access science and, and engage with it. So the point behind the STEM Center is to create programs in collaboration with faculty that directly serve students and helping help to give them access to the sciences. And so even if students don't necessarily want to pursue a major or concentration in the sciences, um, but maybe they, they wanna explore it, they wanna take a class. Um, the idea is that the programs that I'm, I'm hoping to design and you know, with, with faculty will help those students better understand how that science affects their day-to-day -day life, right? So it's not just about the applications of their classroom experiences into what they might do in their career, but also how that expands into their everyday existence in their scientific literacy. And I know you said you didn't want to get into, uh, get into socio-political aspects, but scientific literacy is kind of a relevant thing these days with COVID. Mm -hmm. So whether that stretches from uh, chemistry, biology, physics, any of the sciences, or even into mathematics or the, uh, the budding new field of, of data science, um, the goal is to uh, create programs that'll offer that sort of access and on-ramps for students so that science becomes something real and not just something abstract that they hear about in the classroom. Well, yeah, I think we get a new topic for the next session that, that we're going to have, which is the socio-political aspects of infectious disease and public health policy in the United States in the 2000s. So we already have our next topic for the next session. So thank you, Ben, for that. Oh, I should say it's worth mentioning that while things are still rather new right now, um, I'm hoping and excited to have more tangible information coming for spring semester. So I have a few pilot projects going on, one with the chemistry department, one with the business department. Um, so a few things in the works, but uh, keep your eyes and ears peeled because more information is, is going to come out. Fantastic. Yeah, it sounds, that sounds pretty cool. I know from the student standpoint, if we had this same program available my freshman year, I know what it helped me push a long way. And personally, when I first heard about it a couple of weeks ago from my one friend, we were both ecstatic. We we're like, wow, like we can help grow this new program for to help all of our other peers grow and learn to love our science. And I know that like I have my passion for science. I know everyone in this call hopefully does. And we know everyone watching has the same passion. So um, I encourage everyone watching or tuning in or however you're listening to this um, to really just think about giving to the fund for McDaniel to continue to support all these opportunities that we've had on campus. It makes life way better and allows us to continue to do the research and hopefully with our experiences and pull more students in and get more students in the lab and be able to continue on with the love of science here on the Hill. And thank you so much, Zach. And thanks to all who participated in our Green Terror talk today. And thank you, Green Terra Nation, for tuning in. And I would encourage everyone to take advantage of all the upcoming homecoming events. Again, thank you all for being here.